Yo, yo, yo. Hey, guys, welcome back to another awesome edition of the Best Practices Show podcast. Have you heard of this thing called sleep, airway? It's pretty important in dentistry. And so today I bring back one of my mentors, one of my favorites of all time, Dr. Mark Murphy. And he describes why you shouldn't ignore sleep and the business of it explained today. It's awesome. So please listen up. I hope you guys enjoy it and we'll see you soon. Hey guys, welcome back to the Best Practices Show podcast. You know the jam. I get to bring on some of the best thinkers, teachers, leaders, influencers, friends I've ever had in this great profession of dentistry. And I got a great one for you today. Dear friend of mine, Dr. Mark Murphy. And if you've never seen Dr. Mark Murphy, you have missed out. This guy, you were affectionately referred to as the Robin Williams of dentistry. And then I had never seen you speak. And I actually saw you speak. I laughed out loud. I enjoyed it so much. Did we later pee, became, did you, what? did you wet yourself? Did you, pee I didn't pants? wet myself. No, yeah, no, 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 no. That was a good sign. But we later became friends. I went down to the Pakey condos. You let me, you, you were so even kind. Shared, we even shared a backpack fetish. We both liked the same kind of backpacks for a while. Absolutely. Absolutely. We, and then we got lost driving to the airport in your own town. Do you remember that one? I was drunk. I got to be honest. <laughs> I was you not were drunk. not. You were it not. It was the middle of the day. So yeah, it was after a lecture. You guys will love this. So it was after a lecture. He's like, oh, that was great. In his own town. And he says, I'll take you to the airport. We circled the block like for I it all in all transparency. I think we were laughing so hard telling stories that we both forgot where we were. Probably were. You did get me to the airport, which I'm on grateful time, for. On time, you made your flight. Yeah. Oh, and I sucked all the knowledge out of your brain that I possibly <laughs> could by, by fooling you by going around the block several times. You're the best. And you guys good are going to enjoy back. this. Good to be back on your podcast. I've done a few of these, and they're always fun. And we we could just get on and talk about like the funny stuff we were talking about when we were warming up. So it doesn't matter. We would still always have a good time, and somebody would learn something. Yeah, absolutely. And if you guys, if you're listening to this podcast, you already know how noble this great profession is. And a big part of it, what makes it so noble is you get to meet cool people that stay lifelong friends. And so today we're going to be talking about old friends and new roles. Mm -hmm. So let's go right there. Dr. Mark Murphy, I want to start with, let's do this. Your new role right now, what is it? You got to tell everybody. I'm the executive director of the International Academy of Sleep which is an educational coaching platform, has a diplomate program, all that kind of stuff for teaching dentists who want to get into sleep and be successful doing it. Yeah. Now, yeah. let's go through the history of this. I want, I want people to know who Dr. Mark Murphy is, and then we're going to talk about sleep and some important stuff. But give us a little bio. Who are you? Where have you been? So, so I guess you'd start off by saying I was a, a dentist who... Fell in love with the Panky Institute a hundred years ago, like 1985. I was four years out of school, and it set me on a trajectory and a path for, for maybe developing a, a very sort of a high end crown and bridge, uh, occlusal rehabilitation kind of practice. I ended up teaching down at the Panky Institute in about 1989 or 90. I can't recall exactly. So, however many years ago that was. And uh, ran into a guy, Keith Thornton there. He's the one that got me interested in, in sleep. He certainly is one of the true pioneers in dental sleep medicine. There's no question about it. He and I were teaching a TMD course together. Um, but I, I left the practice of dentistry in about 2000 to take a role with a, a roll-up of dental laboratories that was buying labs across the U.S. and Canada, DTI, Dental Technologies, Inc. They got swallowed up by Microdental. I had left them. I would taken over Mercer Advisors when... Uh, uh, MTI's Manji had gone over to Spear Education and Mercer Advisors had sold to an investment capital company. So it, we, and, and what's great is here I was working for Mercer Advisors. You're over here at ACT Consulting. We're both doing dental practice management consulting at a very high level. And yet we still remain absolutely perfect friends. There's no 
there's enough dentists out there. There's no competition. We we've, we've always remained friends through thick and thin, no matter what we're doing. So that was great. I did that for a few years, and um, then I could see the end of that sort of rolling up at Mercer. Left to go do some consulting and and work with dental laboratories. Ended up back with Microdental then, and with Microdental they had a product called the Micro Two, which is by far the coolest oral appliance for sleep that was out there. And they spun that out as a separate company in 2016. So since the uh, startup of that company in 2016. We took that public in December of 2022 while I was with them as their chief revenue officer um, and and the lead clinical faculty. So I had both a kind of a sales and marketing support role as well as a, a clinical education role. And I got to do that for a number of years, had a blast. It was great. But then last year, just trying to slow down some health concerns. You, you turn 67, you're on your way to 68 like I am now. You decide to slow down a little bit. And I, I did that. So I retired from uh, Prosomnus in March uh, of this year, March 29th, and started up with the International Academy of Sleep uh, two days later. So I was uh, I was unemployed for one day. Yeah. That's what I like to think of it as I was out of a job for one day. I can live yeah. it. Every time you try to get out of the mob, they bring you right back in. Suck you know, you, you yeah. always have a debt you've got to pay with somebody or something. <laughs> no, this is an awesome profession. I can't see you sitting around doing nothing. And this is just such an easy fit for me. Instead of being on a plane every week, and instead of having a responsibility for a company the size of Prosomnus in their income, you know, I, here I've got a, I, I only have to travel like once a month for a long weekend. Um, got to be on, you know, 10 or 12 hours, 14 hours worth of calls a week. It's really nice. It's a great uh, kind of autumn for me in terms of still staying active. You know, I love to teach yeah. and I love to teach sleep. I've been in that for a long time. So this is a really good fit for me. It's right in my wheelhouse and I really like doing it. Yeah. Let's put those two together. You truly do have a teacher's heart. And again, if you haven't seen Mark's teach, you got to see it. Talk about the evolution of sleep. Where are we on the map with sleep today? Yeah. That's that's an interesting kind of question, thinking about the evolution of sleep, because it it has morphed a little bit. But, you know, if we go back, the first devices I made teaching with Keith back at the Panky Institute, he turned me on to making the first types of tap devices. Uh, pretty archaic. But if you think about it, the first maybe 100, 150, 160, however many devices we have to date are all similar constructs where we're using dental materials and dental parts and pieces we find in a dental laboratory. We put them together in a certain way and we can hold the lower jaw forward. Voila, that opens the airway in the back and the patient breathes better at night. That's great. But what happened, which was kind of interesting, is in 2013, 2014, when, when it, inside of microdental, we were messing around with how could we mill out of plastic? How could we make these digitally? How could we make a scalable platform? And some engineers from 3M, specifically a guy named Sung Kim and, and Dave Coons, who were just absolutely pioneers of moving this technology forward, uh, really designed the first precision oral appliance. And so that's really started to revolutionize. So I would say since 24, when they got their FDA approval, uh, 26, when they spun out as a separate company, Prosomnus, you're, you've seen the first I'll make a parallel. You've seen the first smartphone, okay? So we had evolutions of phones and they were big and they were bulky and they were made out of things that we were used to seeing in phones. They look like phones. And suddenly the, they come out with this first smartphone. It's like, this does not look like a phone. This looks like the kind of shit you saw in Star Trek. You know, where they'd open up this thing and it beat me up, Scotty. Like this was super cool. Well, that's the same thing here. These devices are smaller. They're, they work better. There's fewer side effects. The materials are safer from a patient safety profile standpoint. Just so many advantages to them. That's incredible. And so they are changing the way that physicians look at oral appliance therapy, where they used to shun it and used to think it didn't work well and it didn't get paid for well and think that dentists were breaking all the rules and regulations in how they treated people. Now it's starting to become a trusted methodology for treating people that have obstructive sleep apnea. So it's really, really cool. The research that Prosomnus has done, I've been involved in a lot of those studies, written several of the articles, been well published. It's really cool and it's fun to watch that evolve into this new precision medical model. I'm not part of that company more, but I have to say nobody makes devices like they do, period. Still pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, very cool. And so... Now with the evolution of sleep, I mean, we could talk about a lot of things, but I do want to throw the biggest question I get is the business yeah. of sleep. Talk about that. Where are we on the map with the business of sleep? And people do ask me, even on the show, like, how do I even make money on this? How would this be part of my practice business model? Speak to that. Yeah. So, so that's another good question. You're two for two in terms of good questions, Kirby. <laughs> I'm on a roll, buddy. And I didn't write these. Normally I would say that because I wrote them, but I didn't write these questions. <laughs> so 
<laughs> so when you think about the business of sleep, what I, what I want you to think about is it, it's more of a, what do you want sleep to be in your practice or do you want it to become your practice? What we see is people that are successful in sleep and get up to 15, 20, 30 devices a month, which is lucrative. 20 devices a month could be $720,000 a year with a very low overhead, less than 50% overhead. So you're keeping more than half of that. So that the economics is crazy. So people who get successful in that often sell their dental practice, okay? Sit on that asset in a different form. So they change the asset form of their dental practice. And they take that million bucks or whatever they sell it for, throw that in the bank, invest it, whatever they're gonna do. And then they ride the sleep you know, train for the next three, five, seven, eight years while that money grows. And then they have another asset to sell. So we're seeing that over and over again in those successful practices. But the trick is how do you go from, I know how to make an oral appliance because I took a class. Maybe even I took the ADSM mastery program or I did the diplomat program, the IOS. How do you go from, I know how to make an appliance to I know how to make a business about making an appliance. And, and that's what's important. If you decide that all you want to do is an occasional appliance for an occasional patient and you don't care about the economics of it, then you should learn how to make an appliance screen your patients, and maybe one or two or three a month will decide they want an appliance and you wouldn't worry about medical insurance. You wouldn't worry about figuring out how to build medical insurance and build a business model. You would simply build them for cash and you'd hand them a super bill and they could turn that into their insurance company and they usually don't get paid. But you will only do, if you're lucky, two or three, maybe four devices a month. So maybe you're going to do 20 devices a year. But if you want to move from 20 devices a year to 20 devices a month, it's going to be about more than just screening your patients. The next step in that business development model is you've got to start working on developing relationships with local sleep physicians using the science and technology and the studies that are out there to demonstrate to them that how you do it is better. Maybe you work with local dentists who don't want to do sleep. And now you've got an avenue for going from maybe 20 devices a year to 15 or 20 devices a month by developing relationships with a couple or three sleep physicians and getting referrals for them. And, and that's a different business model. In order to do that, you're gonna to need to play the game the way they play the game. And they are in network, they accept Medicare, okay? They live and die in the medical model. They live in an EMR, an electronic medical record or an EHR, electronic health record, not in dental software. So there's a different language, a different way of, of scaling, a different way of uh, uh, documenting what you do, and certainly a different way of billing. That person going from 20 a year to 20 a month is going to need to have a billing partner. They're going to need to have a company like Restful or one of the other billing partners who knows how to build medical insurance. You're going to have to pay for that. Either you'll develop that competency yourself, which doesn't maybe make sense if you're doing five or six or $700,000 a year in sleep. But once you start to get larger than that, you start to say, I'm going to quit paying eight to 10% to a billing partner. And I'll start to keep that money and, and train somebody to do that myself. But it's really that medical billing competency that allows you to scale along with the relationship with the physicians. But you're not done there. The dentists who have become really successful in sleep, the Brandon Hedgecocks, the Stacey Laymans, the um, uh, Kent Smiths, the people that are just blowing it away and don't see us and Sue on Richard, these people found a way to cross that chasm and work beyond that. So one of the models that we do at the International Academy of Sleep is if somebody is, is going from 20 to, to a year to 20 a month, that's great. If they want to go beyond that, they usually end up working with primary cares, cardiologists, endocrinologists, pain physicians, and they actually put a sleep coordinator in their offices who's part of a different business model that they have, and they screen the 30 patients a day that a primary care might see. They screen them for sleep, and they test them in that facility still read by a sleep physician. And then the patients that come out of there that have a positive sleep test and need an oral appliance are referred back to the DME provider. That's the technical term of what a dentist would be doing as a durable medical equipment provider. And they refer them back to there. And so they start to build a sustainable business model. And that's how you see Brandon Hitchcock probably does two or 300 devices a month. And if you figure three grand a pop on that, just to do some quick chair side math, that's absolutely bonkers that's bonkers yeah let's go higher altitude than that mark okay. you've been around for a long time we don't have to count so you're years. saying i'm old i'm not saying you're old I, i'm saying you're brilliant how's oh. that do you like that i do like and that you have, 
And you have really good hair. So if you're watching the video version of this, you already know he has great well, hair. Well, that's coming from somebody that <laughs> has any hair. I don't have hair. any. And I purposely don't have any hair because it would look terrible. So um, you yeah, have seen, you've seen a lot of things come and go. You know, yeah. I mean, several decades. You've seen things come into the conversation. You're like, okay, here it comes. This is not a fad. I can say confidently in 30 years of doing this, being part of this incredible community of dentist, dentistry, there's probably two disruptions that have changed more than that. It's the inflammation and then the airway. And would you agree with that? I mean, even before we hit the go button, 40 years of treatment planning has been turned on its head to include this. Have you seen a bigger disruption? And is this a fad? It's a huge disruption, but I'm going to tell you, there's still a slower adoption of that disruption than I would have expected to see. You know, the right. ADA wrote a white paper, or, uh, I'm sorry, they wrote a uh, recommendation in 2017. The American College of Press wrote a white paper in 2017. In 2017, that is seven years ago this October. Seven years ago, they said we should be screening. And I'm, gonna, I'm willing to bet that way less than half of the 100,000 dentists in this country are actually screening their patients for sleep. Because if they were, the number of patients being treated would be blowing up. 25% of the adult population, probably 50 or 55 million people in the United States have obstructive sleep apnea and 80 or 85% of them are undiagnosed and untreated. So in a practice of 2000 patients, if they've got 500 sleep apneics and 400 of them are undiagnosed and untreated, if you screen those patients, even if just 10% of them in every practice, if everybody was screening, sought treatment, CPAPs would be flying off the shelves, oral appliances would be flying off the shelves, and hypoglossal nerve stimulation surgeries would be going crazy in the OR. Instead, those numbers are growing at 10 to 15% compound annual growth rate, which is, don't, don't get me wrong, 10 to 15% CAGR is still attractive to most people from an investment standpoint, but it's not like what it should be. For somnus, with precision oral appliance, for example, has been growing 40% annual growth rate, which is a much higher CAGR. If you want to do the math on that, it's scary what that number is. I don't even want to say it out loud. So disruption, yes. Innovative, yes. Um, but it still doesn't have the adoption that I would have expected. I would have expected more dentists to be into sleep. I think it's this fear of medical billing. Uh, maybe there's some fear. I mean, I, I even think, you know, I'm, I love the Panky Institute, but I think there was even a cautious movement there to say, maybe when we were making devices in centric relation, making bite guards in centric relation for clenching and grinding and TMD, sorry, we didn't realize that we were opening the VOD to do that. I mean, we did realize we were opening the VOD, but we were auto-rotating the mandible and maybe compromising the airway. That's yeah. what we know about today. And and I think it, it's hard for these large, somewhat dogmatic entities to say, yeah, we were probably doing it wrong and we should... First, think about the airway every time we make a sleep device, every time we make a bike guard. And, and I just don't think that's still happening at the level it should be. It should be happening across the board. Yeah. So I have so many thoughts on that. You still think there's a lot we don't know? And and let me couple that. You listen to the conversation right now, the narrative. You have camps. You know, you've got a lot of people arguing. And they're arguing pretty much the same thing, but they can't even, I mean, it's almost like watching a debate. They can't even get along while they're debating. Well, you know, uh, you and I have a long history together and it, <laughs> yes, it started a long, long time ago, you coming down to the Panky Institute and impressing the hell out of us, by the way, you, you remember that I've told you that a number of times, you oh. impress the crap out of everybody. And, uh, and you still impress people today. You're, you've got an incredible uh, acumen for helping people grow their practices and everything like that. But even way back then, there were camps, right? And so there's always going to be camps. And, and maybe I'm going to call them schools of thought because the right. moment I say camp, it sounds like there's going to be a war. <laughs> but I want to diffuse that just a little bit, even though we're in this challenging time right now. I don't know when this podcast is going to go live, but we're in the middle of a, a heated uh, political season. Right. And so I'm going to take away the word camp, and I'm going to say there are different schools of thought on occlusion. There are different right. schools of thought on bonding. There are different schools of thought on how you manage the airway. Should we grow the airway? Should we not grow the airway? Do we use pharyngometry? Do you see T? There's lots of schools of thought. I'm way more worried, like I was back then, you'll remember me saying this, about the atheists. 
than I am about what school of thought you you attach yourself to. Because if we look across dentistry, the percentage of general dentists who are really paying attention to occlusion in their practice was still really small. And in this little small space, everybody's fighting with this encampment and these schools of thought. And it's like, that's noisy. That's And everybody on the outside is listening to this noise, but they're atheists. They don't believe in any of these schools of thought. Same thing with sleep. There are 200,000 dentists. Listen to these numbers. These are scary. There's 200,000 dentists in the country, okay? We think maybe as many as 100,000 have taken a sleep course. That's pretty impressive. We know that somewhere between 1 and 2,000, let's say 1,500 to pick a number, but I don't care if you choose 17 or 1,200, it's not 2,000, have ever billed medical insurance for an oral appliance. And maybe 200, maybe 250, not 300, are really doing a lot of sleep. So is it a disruption? Hell yes. Is it innovative? Hell yes. Are there different schools of thought? Hell yes. But I'm not going to spend a lot of time fighting with the Vivos people or fighting with these other schools of thought. Um, I just think it's, I'm glad that there's a, maybe a thousand or 1500 people that are paying enough attention that they figured out a way to build medical insurance and help people sleep better at night and manage some of these comorbidities. Yeah. Because once you get into medical, I mean, roll up your sleeves, get into it. It's not as difficult no, it's as super, you would think. No, no, no. It's not even as difficult. It, every dentist who says sleeps hard means uh, working with physicians is hard. They mean billing medical insurance is hard. Uh, they mean getting people to say yes to a two or three or $4,000 hour device because they're not using medical insurance. That's hard. The doing super, super smoking easy. Uh, taking a protrusive bite, there's three or four or five different kind of acceptable ways, and they all are going to work pretty well. And plus, you can move it around forward and back from there. So that's not as critical. Getting the midlines is. And then which device you use. Yes, there's better devices, but still, you know, even the ones that aren't the most precision devices still work fairly well, still work comparably from an effectiveness standpoint to CPAP. But what, what what it is, is it's taking a bite and making an upper and lower thing. And it's not like adjusting dots like you do on a bite splint. It's way easier. I mean, literally, I hand them to the patient. They put them in their mouth. They close together. We talk about how you take them out. It's a 10-minute delivery. I couldn't deliver a bite splint in 10 minutes. Couldn't yeah. do it. Yeah. If you followed me around, well, you wouldn't want to do that anyway. But you'd see I have some Murphyisms. I, I, I've i stolen so many of your quotes. And one of them you said, you've actually used it on the podcast several times. You're like, you can't learn how to swim by watching a video. You actually have to jump in the pool. So let's talk about this. When it comes to sleep, you don't have to do all of it. Sometimes you just got to get into it and you can start to learn. Can you speak more about that? Yeah. So inside iOS, we have this program, we call it the fast start program. So when somebody comes on board um, and they haven't really done sleep before, we try to teach them what they need to know, but then they got to jump in the pool. You're exactly right. You can't learn how to swim without getting wet. So we tell them in the first month, in the first month, we want you to treat three or four or five patients. And they're like, how the hell do I do that? Well, you treat yourself, your wife, your friends, your neighbors, your staff, you treat people, you know, and you don't worry about getting paid. You eat the cost of that device five, six, 700 bucks, who cares? They're gonna give you all the manufacturers will give you some break on those first devices you do. So they'll help you out with that. Personas does that, everybody does that. So make your first devices the first month on people you know and get your fingers and hands wet and deliver a device and find out what was hard, find out what was easy. I couldn't figure out this part with the bite, watch another video, you know, smooth those wrinkles out and then start screening your patients and start treating them for real. And then, you know, maybe in the beginning, you do that for cash the first month or two. So you're doing another three or four devices the second or the third month, and you're getting paid cash by those patients. And then start to figure out how you're gonna go talk to physicians and figure out how you're gonna do medical billing. And so that, that next piece of time could be two or three or five or six or eight or nine months. It doesn't matter. Sometimes it depends how busy you are in your practice, how excited you are about doing sleep. But this idea of getting in and getting started, I, I just had a call, was it yesterday? Yeah, it was yesterday with a dentist who said he took a sleep course with another another group over a year ago, bought a piece of equipment that he would be using, and he's finally made seven devices. And I told him seven devices is great. He says, yeah, but they're on like the last six weeks. So he was a year before he, he, was, he just kept reading about how to go swimming. Yeah. He wouldn't jump in the pool. And when he finally jumped in the pool, now he's having some problems. I'm like, yeah. this is great. He goes, what do you mean it's great? This is great because you can't fix those problems till you make a device. So if we stand around waiting for our first device to be perfect, we're never going to get started. 
You first never get you can be perfect, you're never going to get started. Your first whatever it is, never going to. If your first, po- first podcast, I bet if you went back and listened to your first couple of podcasts, you'd think, holy shit, what was I talking about? You were on the first couple, so you would know exactly that's exactly what happened. <laughs> you were thinking, why am I even on this thing? You know? I'm because, thinking that today, by the way. I'm still thinking of <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, I will track you down and make you come on this. So, um, and I think you would agree. I mean, even if you don't treat, which we would argue, don't do that. Like you should learn how just by in a sea of sameness, so many dentists are trying to differentiate themselves and try to stand out as a unique dental practice. Even diagnosing this and choosing not to treat would well, set you apart, right? Well, careful where you know, even screening for it, even and screening them out for testing and diagnosis because the dentist can't diagnose this, but I know what you, you know exactly what you mean. Even right. identifying the people that are at risk and pushing those people in the right direction. First yeah. off, you get to write down in your chart that you told them that they're at high risk for sleep apnea and they should get tested. They don't want to. You can kind of wipe yourself of any kind of guilt things you're going to have if they don't get treated. Uh, but second off, when you see these people get treated, even if you're not the one treating them, and they come back and they say, thank you ever so much. My husband and I or my wife and I are back in bed together. Or... Uh, my medications are working, or I'm finally starting to lose weight, or I sleep so much better, I have so much more energy, what, whatever it might be. Whatever the positive symptom management that you see from that activity, it is highly rewarding and very motivational to the dental team. So you and your team, even if you decide not to treat, you're going to still hear these great stories coming back about people who are getting treated. And it's not just oral appliances, by the way. It's fine if it's CPAP. There's nothing wrong with CPAP. CPAP is a great treatment. It's just, it's hard for most people to get used to. And so oral appliances are much easier for people to wear. So the the uh, adherence or compliance rate for that is much higher than it is for CPAP. CPAP, about half the people wear that. And with oral appliances, about 90% actually wear it. So it's just, it, it wins on adherence and it isn't quite as efficacious as CPAP. But the math, when you multiply the two, it comes out, it's not inferior to CPAP, which is kind of cool. Yeah, so cool. You're one of the most passionate people I know. I know you never take on a project without a passion. So I want you to talk about the passion behind the International Academy of Sleep. Like, what's the purpose of it? What does it do? Can you talk about that? So, yeah. So um, about four years ago, in my role with Persomnus as their lead clinical faculty, uh, we uh, developed a sponsorship relationship with the International Academy of Sleep. We don't really do CE at, at Persomnus. I say we. It's hard for me to let go of that. Um, the uh, Persomnus doesn't do uh, education of any kind. They partner with companies. We didn't want to find ourselves competing with DS3 or Nearman or Awaken to Sleep or the International Academy or any of these groups or the ADSM. We wanted to partner with them and support that. So we 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 signed up for a sponsorship overnight. We had a very uh, significant sponsorship with the International Academy of Sleep. And uh, we we paid them probably, I would say, a lot more money than we were paying a lot of the other sponsors that we or the other groups that we sponsored. But in return, we noticed that they were growing a lot more than other groups. Um, their business with Prosomnus and using Prosomnus devices. So just say their group of dentists being successfully going from 20 a year or 10 a year to 20 a month is so significant that the business with Prosomnus was growing so much that our sponsorship continued to grow. As part of that role for the last four years, um, they would have me come in and I would do a lecture. And because I was a dentist, because I lectured on sleep, I didn't just come in and do some sort of promo thing for Prosomnus. I would come in and do real content for them on their sleep education. So sometimes I'd talk about device selection. I'd talk about the science of oral appliance therapy. I would talk about screening and treating patients. I would talk about the physiology of sleep. I had a number of different topics I've done for them over the years. And then I would go to their kind of community retreats that they have that's part of their membership is they have these three times a year they all get together in fun places and they have a track that's kind of behavioral and they have a track that's kind of clinical and lots of and they would have me stick in there and i'd talk about leadership or i'd talk about communication you know fun stuff that that's old practice management kind of stuff so i really got to know the international academy of sleep so as i was thinking of leaving for somnus because i needed to work less i needed to slow down i needed to semi-retire um avi weissvogel who was the owner and still is the owner and the CEO at the time. And I had had several good conversations. And he, by the way, and I have a background similar to you and I, uh, he was in one of my Panky courses back in 2005. So some 11 years, 20, 21 years ago, 20 or 19 years ago, he was in one of my classes at Panky. So I've known him a long time and he's busy running the International Academy of Sleep 
and a software and billing company called Restful. And then he's got a DSO group that buys dental practices called Freedom Dental Partners with Brady Frank, that group. And so he's super busy. And so he's said to me a couple of times, and he used to have Barry Glassman, for example, who was uh, his uh, go-to guru on sleep education, but he and Barry had kind of parted ways over the years. Barry had some different ideas than he did. And he had said to me several times and sort of semi-joking, but hinting, hey, if you ever get tired of prosomnus, if you're ever leaving prosomnus, you want to come over here and you know, work with me, love to have you, love to have you. So now I'm February, you know, January, February, and I'm thinking about how I got to slow down. And I, I literally say to him, were you serious? And he says, yeah. And I said, okay, because I've been inside there. I've lectured. I've seen these people. I've kicked the tires without them knowing it, right? I've been behind the curtain and seen how they really operate this thing. And it's it's very successful. They, they run a very successful educational and coaching program. So I said, all right, let's 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 talk about this because I'm thinking of leaving for Somers. And his eyes got big and we started talking. And, and the next thing we know, we came to a, a, a nice agreement of what my role would be and how I'd work. And so I let Prasamus know and finished out the month with them. Uh, I still do some, I, I guess I'd call it cleanup work for Prasamus. I handle their elevated uh, calls that they have to clinical care for clinical care questions. So they have a small uh, monthly honorarium that they pay me for that. But I was able to make this really good, smooth transition to this company that I guess I would think of it as a coaching platform that has tremendous amounts of education, a fast start. They've got a boot camp for rapid learning on sleep. If you haven't taken some good courses before, they've got a year long diplomate program. They have these three times a year retreats that you get to go to. The coaching calls are every other week. You're in the coaching business. This is every other week. Three of the four weeks, they have a clinical coaching call with one of the clinical coaches. And the other time they have a support call because there's, you heard me talking about this development of getting out and work with sleep physicians. So you need to know how to talk about the science. You need to know how to meet with sleep physicians and how to talk to them and how to get past the gatekeeper. And then eventually, how do you set up the different businesses so that you still have a dental practice? Then you have a dental sleep medicine DME provider. Then you have a management company that can work with internists and cardiologists. So there's a lot of contracts and legalese that they figured out for you. It's all been vetted by counsel. So they got a really carefully managed pathway that is similar, um, but everybody goes at their own pace and everybody bobs and weaves through this, you know, pathway. It's wide. And some people, uh, we had we had a webinar last night and, and Merle Tall, one of our coaches, talked about how really in about a year, he got up to 20 devices a month. And that's that's probably $700,000 a year in incremental revenue to him. And he's passionate enough. He's going to bring an associate on. And I can just see that next year he's going to talk to us about selling his general dental practice. And then he's going to move into sleep. Who knows what he's going to do? But I mean, that's we see that happen. And so there's this viable pathway for learning and education. And uh, Avi wanted me to kind of head that up. And so we talked about me first testing that out a little bit with the uh, like lead clinical faculty role with them, chief learning officer. So I did that for a while. And then... Uh, took over June 1st, and it's been really kind of fun. So it's been fun to maybe just turn the dials a little bit and kind of put the Mark Murphy signature on it. We just had a very successful event in Austin, Texas, where several people signed up. And and the cool thing, Kirk, you've got the same scenario. You can't take 100 clients a year. You can't no. take 200 clients. You don't have this infinite capacity. We can take on 30 or 40 new clients a year because we have the coaching, we have the infrastructure, we have the programs. All that stuff takes people and manpower. And if you said, hey, we're going to double the number of members tomorrow, I'm screwed as the as the executive director. I'm screwed because we do not have the infrastructure to manage twice as many people. We would have to build up to that over the course of the next, you know, six to 12 months. That would take time. So it's it's fun. I'm living a dream, doing what I love, get to teach. Buddy, you're the best. I want you to tell people uh, where to go, how to get started, all that kind of, But before we do, yeah, give us some final thoughts. Wrap this up into a nice little bow if I'm a dentist listening. Yeah, so I, I, I'm, I'm going to fall back on some things that I've said for a long time that I wasn't saying about sleep. Um, things that I've heard you say, things that we've said to people, and that's, you know, you can have any kind of a practice you want. It's about your vision. You know, it's about Alice in Wonderland coming to the fork in the road and asking the Cheshire cat which one to take. And cat says, well, it depends, Alice, where are you going? She said, I don't know. He said, well, then it doesn't matter which road you take. So it's about making it matter which road you want to take. If somebody commits to wanting to do dental sleep medicine, um, then there's a support structure out there for you that can help you get there. If you say, I want to do that, I want to be involved, 
and it sounds exciting and I want it to be successful, but I'm not willing to commit to it. I'm not willing to put in four to six hours a week. I'm not willing to make an investment of time or money. Then you're very likely not going to be successful and you'll be frustrated and you'll be another one of those people who's the hundred thousand dentists who've taken a sleep course and really aren't doing sleep. So you really have to make a decision to, to have that as be a vision for what you want to do. And then if you decide that's what you want and you really want to move into sleep, you know, if you want to go fast, you go alone. But if you want to go far, you go together. Mm -hmm. And this togetherness, this community has an incredible success rate. Uh, they, they sit there and virtually we will guarantee somebody's success if they um, do the kinds of things that we've designed for them to do to be successful in sleep. We've never seen somebody really not be successful. Um, you know, you could join the best gym in town and you could hire the best trainers, but if you don't get up in the morning and go to the gym, nothing changes. So it's about having a vision for what you really want to do because doing sleep isn't everybody's cup of tea, but it's great, super rewarding. And then it's about making a commitment to that. So my final thoughts are, you know, once once a Cheshire cat says, well, where are you headed? And you tell them where you're headed. And for God's sakes, pay the man and join him in and let him coach you down that guided path. That's for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, take us to that path. So if I'm listening, where do I go? Where do I yeah, start? So so we we have three different kinds of educational offerings uh, that are weekend programs. We have what we would call a typical blueprint, uh, International Academy of Sleep Blueprint. It's a two-day program. You learn a lot of sleep. You learn about the business model. You get stuck listening to me talk a lot about sleep. Um, I think it's probably 14 hours of continuing education that that's important to somebody. But it, it gives you a chance to kick the tires, hear what we're all about, see what we're all about. And you are going to get pitched to see if you want to join the International Academy of Sleep. I'm not going to shortchange anybody. You're going to get a great education that weekend, but you are going to get pitched to say, if this is what you really want to do, we'll be happy to help you get there and help you spend a bunch of money, but you'll be successful. It'll be one of the best investments you've ever made with an incredible ROI. The second one we have is called a Total Immersion Program, where we actually spend the first day in Dr. Brandon Hedgecock's office in Austin, Texas. He's one of the top five, maybe top three, maybe top two, I don't know for sure, sleep dentists in the country. And it's a multi-million dollar, multi-location dental sleep medicine practice, works with physicians, works with local dentists, primarily works with large cardiology groups out of Austin Health. And you go there the first day and you spend the morning looking, uh, they two groups, so one group spends the morning observing their clinical operation in the afternoon in their administrative side, seeing what a busy, fully blossomed, incredible, can't get much better than this sleep practice looks like. And that's one hell of an opportunity that day. And then the next two days are the same sort of a blueprint listening to me and looking at the business model. And again, you're going to get pitched. The third program, and this one's actually coming up in uh, September for us. So again, I don't know when this podcast gets released. So maybe we've missed it, but we'll have them next year if you did. And it's called a momentum program. And it's two days. And they're always in Vegas because Vegas is an attractive nuisance for some people. We limit it to the number of people that we can have there. And we, we try to make all these very affordable by offering tremendous discounts because it's it's not how we don't make our money doing the CE on the weekend things. We make our money when somebody signs up to be a member. And we know that we're going to have, you know, 20 people there and six or seven are going to sign up to be a member. not all 20. That's just math. That's life. Get over it. But the ones in Vegas are a little different focus. We call them the momentum programs because if somebody has taken the sleep courses and they've kind of gotten into sleep, but they're not doing very much sleep, they're stuck. We want to try to give them the momentum to get unstuck. So even though to the casual observer, they might see some similarities to one of our regular blueprints, it's at a little higher level for somebody that maybe already has a little bit of sleep knowledge. Um, this guy I was talking to on the phone the other day who uh, yesterday who's just on seven devices, was the perfect kind of per person to go to a program like that. He, he is stuck. He's done seven devices in a little over a year, doesn't know how to unwind that and get unstuck. That's a great program for him to go to. And we make them all affordable. Uh, the secret code, if anybody wants to know, go to the IAOS website, IAOS.com, International Academy of Sleep, IAOS.com. Look at the offerings, the locations. I think we're going to be in Vegas, uh, St. Louis, Missouri, and then we'll be in... Uh, Austin, Texas, again, for another immersion program. We've got one of each kind of program left this year. And if you put in the code MARK, that's my name, 75, that's the percentage discount you'll get on signing up. So if the program was $1,000 or $2,000, you'll get 75% off from signing up. And if that doesn't make it affordable, I'm sorry, we can't help. That's, 
we we could pay you to come, but I'm afraid too many people would come. And that's the other thing. We we kind of want the right people to come who are really interested in sleep so we can help grow them and educate them. But Mark 75 is the code that you'd want to use. That is awesome. Awesome. Thank you, brother, for sharing that. Now, if you're listening to the podcast and you're not taking notes, we're taking notes for you. So you can flip up to the notes. All that Mark has shared will be right there. You can click right on the link and we'll put the, uh, the code in there, Mark 75. So... Good stuff, man. As always, I just love hanging out with you. Well, if you if you want to do something a little outside the box, one of these next times we'll talk about the recent science of oral appliance therapy and CPAPs and hypoglossal nerve stimulation, how that all works. The only problem with that is it's kind of a narrower audience for you. It'd be for people that you might have that are doing sleep that want to get up to date on the latest science and the latest um, kind of technology that's out there. Hey, I I would love to know because I I am a, I'm a problem child, so I'm a CPAP we're both user. Both yeah, and I have AFib, so I you know I, I'm I'm all down for that. And uh, you know I've had Uchi on many times, and he repeats it over and over. Uchi is the the first. Uchi, well. was, Uchi was in one of my uh, Panky classes down there too. He was in his he did his E one with me. Oh, dude, he's the best. I, I'm I'm gonna get his. I'm gonna get his. Uh, I'm 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 gonna totally do a. An impersonation of something, man. Gotta eat those. Gotta eat those apples, man. Come on, man. So if I, I try to do an impersonation of him, I have to stand up and hold my gut in for a very long time, and that's tiring. That's tiring because he always looks so fit. I just want to. I want to lose weight when I see him. The guy's what? amazing. Like he's just amazing. And if you don't get excited being around him or you, you just you're totally just. He's so upbeat and positive. He just exudes energy and charisma all at the same time. As do you, by the way. As do you, brother. So mutual admiration society. Yeah, absolutely. All so right. thank you, brother, sure. for being on. Stick around while I say goodbye to everybody else. But thank you guys for listening to the Best Practices Show podcast. Hey, if you enjoyed today, do us a favor. Just hit the share button. Keep sending us suggestions for things that you guys want to see. Go down to the show notes. And click on the link that Murph shared and use his code. I promise you, you will absolutely love it. Not only will it be educational, but it will be entertaining for sure, to say the least. So we'll have a few drinks in Vegas together. What the hell? There you go. There you go. That's worth the trip alone. So until we see you guys next time or you hear from us next time, keep watching or keep listening to the Best Practices Show. You guys enjoy your day. Mm -hmm.